We are looking at this uh, word, sanctification. Remember, we are studying sanctification from the light of uh, from the light of grace, in the light of grace. Sanctification. Sanctification. We want to examine sanctification because uh, we have heard this word used so much in, uh, in, scre- in uh, churches. We've heard people talk about sanctification and people uh, tell you so many things or what to do to be sanctified or how you can keep yourself holy. Often people tell you to, that uh, we should work hard to keep ourselves holy, to keep ourselves sanctified. Well, when we finish examining the Bible, you will come to the conclusion from the Bible that sanctification is the work of God. Sanctification is the work of God, not the work of man. Sanctification is the work of God in its entirety. God does all the work. And uh, we're going to see the, you may, it is important that we understand the truth because apart from truth, we will not grow spiritually. Without growth, without truth, there will be no spiritual growth. And with that spiritual growth, we will not enjoy the blessings that God has for us. With that spiritual growth, we will never enjoy the blessings that God has for us. And this, that's the reason why it is important that we pay attention to the study of the Word of God to make sure we understand what God intends to communicate to us. God can only communicate one way. He doesn't, confl- he doesn't have a conflicting way of communication. He can tell us one thing here and then uh, mean something else on the other page. And people often tell you that uh, it's your interpretation. It is your interpretation. Well, there is only one interpretation. Because God always intends to communicate one way. He doesn't intend to conflict or to confuse us. And so, as we study sanctification, always remember, not only sanctification, in all the word of God, God intends that we understand what he wants to communicate to us. And that is the truth. Apart from truth, there is no spiritual growth. Apart from spiritual growth, there is no blessing. Uh, people often tell you, God will bless you if you give. God will bless you if you give more money. God will bless you if you do this or do that. That is very difficult to justify from the Bible. God doesn't bless you because you are giving more, 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 more. God blesses you because you have learned and you're growing and because of your spiritual growth, he can bless you. It doesn't mean we don't have to give money. It is proper. It's a part of worship. We give money to church. We give money to missionary work. But we don't give money so that God will bless us. We don't give money that God will bless you. He doesn't say, God, let me give you money so you, you bless me back. That is not how God operates. That is not the umbrella of grace. It's dif- difficult. We, we turn on televisions today. We see people, they tell you, you sow, you sow your seed. Sow the seed. Sow, sow the seed so that you get more money. From what I see from the Bible, I don't know where they're getting their own from. Uh, and the common sense will tell you God says in Romans 8 verse 32 
Romans 8, 32. He, God, who did not spare his only son, but he gave, but gave him for all of us, how shall he not with him or through him give us all things? When you read that verse, what do you really understand? Romans 8.32, when you read it, what do you really understand? Take, take a look at it at, afresh. Turn to your Bible, Romans 8.32. Romans 8, verse 32. We're just warming up. It says that God did not spare his only son, but gave him for us. Then he asked the question, how will he or how can he not through him freely give us all things? Now, what it means is that what did we do for God to give us his son? Did we do anything? Nothing. <coughs> his son and the blessing that God gives to us, which one is greater? Jesus Christ and the blessing, money, or clothing, and that we food that we get, which one is greater? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is greater. What did we do to get the greater? What did we do to receive the greater? Nothing. Then what can we do to receive the lesser? Nothing also. That is grace. We didn't do anything to receive the gift of the son himself we shouldn't do anything to receive other blessings that come from God he blesses us on the basis of grace God blesses us on the basis of grace and his blessing to us is based on our growth on our capacity to be able to handle his blessing. There are people today, if you give them more blessing they can handle, it will destroy them. It will become a distraction. There are people today, if you give them more money, more money will become distraction. And so God knows, God cannot give you something you cannot handle. That's what he says in 1 Corinthians, Chapter uh, 10, verse 13, he said that God will not allow you to be tested beyond that which you are able to be. God cannot allow you to be tested beyond your own strength. Invariably, God will not allow you to be blessed beyond your capacity, beyond that which you are able to be. Uh, I remember growing up. Growing up, we used, we used to go to travel miles and miles away to fetch water. And uh, we carry containers, jars on our heads. And we go and fetch water from a long distance. Well, we start as early as sometimes two, three years to trek five, six miles with the grown-ups. But when we, when we go, the grown-up ones will be carrying big jars that will hold gallons or a lot of liters. But a three-year-old will not be able to carry big jars. The mother will give you a small bottle, sometimes like a cook bottle, bottle to carry water with. And you, you, are, you, are, you are being trained. But they will give you this bottle because that's only what you can carry. That's what you have capacity to carry. 
You can cry all you want. You can say, Mother, I don't want to go until you give me that big jar. Your mother isn't going to give you the big jar because you're crying. You can say, Mother, okay, if you give me the big jar, I'm going to do something for you. I'm going to, see, I'm going to give you my, I'm going to, uh, take this, this is a gift for you. Your mother isn't going to give you a big jar. Why? You just don't have capacity for it. You don't have strength to carry a big jar. The same thing in the spiritual life. God will not bless you, get that right, He will not bless you beyond your own spiritual strength. Otherwise, the blessing will become a distraction for you. There are people today, if you give them more money, you won't see them in the church anymore. Now, people often come to church, many people, because they are in a, in a bind. They want to go to church so that they will get a relief. They want to go to church so that they will get a help. They want to go to church so that they will give, get a, a breakthrough. If you give them that breakthrough, oh, they're gone. You will see them back again. Because they don't have capacity for, for what they have. And so God's blessing is based on your spiritual growth. And, and that's what Paul told the uh, Ephesians, Ephesians, the church at Ephesus. Before he left them, he told them, now in, uh, in Acts chapter 20, uh, he told them, verse, think, verse 32, now I commend you to the word of his grace. Now I commend you first to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and then give you inheritance, which is blessing. The word of God builds you up and then it gives you blessing. And so it is important that we pay attention to the studying of the word of God to be able to comprehend what the Bible teaches. We are examining sanctification. We have defined as sanctification from the Greek that it means to set apart. It means to set apart. To consecrate. I'm going to add something to it this morning. And that is, people often think that sanctification means to take somebody from sin and make him pure. Not necessarily. I have told you that there are in, in, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, there were elements. Elements in the temple were sanctified, like these utensils. The utensils didn't do any sin. Spoons, they didn't commit any sin, isn't it? But they were sanctified, set apart unto God. To even make it, to make it, to, uh, did Jesus Christ sin? Did he ever sin? But the Bible says that he was sanctified. Turn to John 10.36. John speaks of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you say of him, John 10 verse 36, Do you say of him whom the father get that? What 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 do we have there in your own Bible? What do you say there? Father set apart. Set apart. Okay. What other translation do you have? What does he say in your other translation? <coughs> Who else got another translation? My translation says here whom whom the father sanctified. Okay, what did he say? John 10, 36. Uh -huh. Say ye of him whom the Father had sanctified. Good. Sent good. 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 Very, very good. So we see the, the issue, we see the key, we see the, you, your, word, your version there already put it in, in the Greek, set apart. That is the Greek, set apart. Jesus Christ was set apart. The Father set him apart. 
the father sanctified him. But he didn't do any sin. He didn't commit any sin. So who, who gave us the idea that sanctification means that you have been, you are holy, you, are, you don't commit sin anymore. That's not the meaning from the Bible. So we don't, we, we don't, we don't claim, we don't stay with what people say or what people think. We try to stick to what the Bible says. If you stick to what the Bible says, you will be free from error. We go into error, but in churches today, when we start bringing in man-made tradition and ignore what the Bible says, the Bible alone is sufficient for us to live our lives. The Bible alone is sufficient for us to get to know God. The Bible alone is sufficient for us to understand the plan of God. The Bible alone is sufficient for us to know how to execute the plan of God for our lives. And so, sanctification means to set apart. And Jesus Christ was set apart by God. Jesus Christ was set apart by God. And we're going to uh, remember what we are studying. We are, what, what we are studying, we say that there are three the sanctification can be divided into three. Sanctification can be divided into three. We said the first one was positional sanctification. Sanctification divided into three. We said that the first one, positional. Positional sanctification. Positional sanctification, that's the first one. The second one is experiential. Experiential sanctification. And the third one is ultimate. Ultimate sanctification. We are concentrated on the first one. We say something about the second one, experiential sanctification has to do with our daily spiritual living. It has to do with our daily lives. As we set ourselves apart unto God to execute his plan for our lives. That's experiential sanctification. It has to do with your spiritual living. As you intend to duplicate the life of Christ in you. As you learn the word of God daily. You begin to acquire the mind and the thinking of Jesus Christ. The more you know the word of God, the more you know the truth the more you have the potential to, to transplant Christ's thinking, Christ's thought into you. And before you know it, you begin to think like Christ. I, do you know we are, we are Christians? Isn't it what we are called? Are we not Christians? Yeah, we're Christians. But do you know that the word Christian, do you know how it came about? You have an idea? Good. Good. But that name was not, it wasn't something that came from the church. The As you learn about the grace of God, if you begin to deflect your own pride, because you cannot be, a, you cannot wear the jacket of pride, and still be thinking like Christ. The jacket of pride has to go. But it can go until you understand that everything God does for you is based on grace. 
You see, what makes us to inflate our, ourselves is because we think that there's anything we do on ourselves. When you come to understand that everything... I don't see any reason why you should even inflate your shoulders for pride. Everything. Just for the fact that you wake up this, day, this morning and uh, uh, get, get dressed and you, 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 before you know it, you're up here. doesn't mean you, it's, it's a pattern. It's not something that must, be, must happen every day. Every day. Think of it. There are people who are not here. There are people who will never be here. Even, there are people out there who are already departed. Even those who are younger than you. They're already gone. They're no longer here. And so just for the fact that you wake up doesn't necessarily mean that you are right to wake up. It's the grace of God that caused you to wake up. <coughs> it, it, it is the grace of God that, get, that uh, without the grace of God, you and I will never be here. We will never have salvation. We will never have anything. And so that's why Paul said to the Corinthians when they were trying to inflate their shoulders, Paul asked them, what did you have that you did not receive? Just know one thing. Everything we have, we have received. From who? From God. So if everything is a gift, why boast for a gift? You can only boast for something you manufacture. You can't boast for something that is not your own making. If somebody did a work, you don't take the credit and start boasting. So God has done all the work for us. We have no basis to boast. We have no basis to inflate our shoulders. And so the more you understand, the more you learn the word of God, the problem we have uh, all over the world, as we travel all over the world, the problem we have we come to see is that many people are no longer teaching the word of God as it ought to be taught. See, everybody can preach, but not everybody can teach. Teaching is different, different from preaching. Preaching, you can just take Psalm 48 and just wow, 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 before you know it, you're done. Teaching is just like uh, every in school. When you go to school, do you want your professor to, to come and preach algebra for you, to you? How would you enjoy having a, a professor that is preaching uh, English, preaching uh, uh, biology? You want a, a person to teach you, isn't it? And so the same thing in the Word of God, you connect that. Experiential sanctification, that is not our study. But if we have time, we may take a little bit of, uh, uh, we may take, we may start it a little bit. Another one is of ultimate sanctification. Ultimate sanctification is the work of God, whereby He determines the time, the place, and the manner by which He removes every believer from this planet Earth and bring and brings the person home. That's ultimate sanctification. God removes you from this world. And he brings you to himself. That can happen either by death or by rapture. And at that time, you and I will have been stripped off from the stain of death. And we will be face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ. Ultimate sanctification. That is the work of God in its entirety we play no part in our departure. You and I, we do not play any part in our departure. God determines when we depart, how we depart. Nothing can take a believer out of this life until God decides. Not an accident, not even a cancer or any kind of disease. Cannot remove a believer from this life until God determines. God decides the time, the manner, and the place. That is his sovereignty. That's his prerogative. And so, ultimate sanctification, again, that's not our st subject. I'm just uh, letting you know that sanctification is divided into three. 
The first one is positional. The second one is experiential. The third one is ultimate. Experiential is your daily spiritual life. Your daily spiritual life. <laughs> As you learn the word of God and you apply the truth that you learn on a daily basis, you are fulfilling this number two. You are fulfilling number two, experiential sanctification. Ultimate sanctification is left for God. To, he will remove you from this life when he decides. He, will know, he knows the time and the place that this will occur. But we are, so, we are much concerned about positional sanctification. And it is in this one that we will pay a little bit of attention. Like I said, when we understand this, it will help us to have a better appreciation of the grace of God. It will help us to have a better appreciation. It will help us to uh, appreciate grace the more. And so, let's flip and then, so that that doesn't confuse us, let's just take it positional sanctification. Positional sanctification. Positional sanctification and uh, don't forget this, don't forget this Positional, positional. You already know the word sanctification, and you know the, you just connected the word position. Positional sanctification. You say, what do you mean by positional sanctification? <coughs> well, let me see if I can have a, 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 this. Let me take this jacket. Uh, this uh, uh, shoot and uh, give you an analogy. Uh, this jacket. Is, is blue, or oh, that's basically it's black, and this pin, this marker that I'm having, assuming that this jacket is like a, anything that touches it, it becomes black. If I take this marker and put into inside this jacket, what color will it become? Black, isn't it? It will, it will turn black. In other words, this has become black because of this jacket. It has shared in the blackness of this jacket by, by virtue of position. And so, positional sanctification, you and I have shared, I'll come back, you and I have shared by, in Christ's sanctification, by virtue of our position in Christ. That's it. This is a theological word. This is a theological word. It's not something I invented. It's a theological word. Positional sanctification. Remember, we say that Jesus Christ, John 10 verse 36, Jesus Christ is said to be sanctified. Jesus Christ is sanctified. John 10, 36. God the Father God the Father sanctified Christ. He set him apart. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be very slow. I'm not going to run. I'm going to be very, very slow so that we will, I will give you the opportunity to understand this subject. Let's go back. God the Father sanctified Jesus Christ. That we know, isn't it? Now, Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. Jesus Christ died on the cross for our, our sins. Here you are. Here you are. Here I am. So it's not you. That's not a good picture of you. Now, 
when I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, when I so I want you, I want you, what I want you to be able to collect here is grace. When I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, faith alone, nothing else. I am not saved because I have changed. I am not saved because I have denounced my sins. I am not saved because I have confessed my sins. I am not saved because of anything I have done. People often tell you, confess your sin before you are saved. That is not from the Bible. <coughs> Anytime you find a place, confess your sins, it's always for believers. Who are already saved. For unbelievers, it is always believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. Whatever, whatever salvation relates to, whatever salvation relates to unbeliever, is always faith. Believe. How can what can I do to be saved? Paul to the the the, the man who, the, the the prison guard. You know the story. In Acts 16, <coughs> when God shook the prisons and every all the doors were open, and the man came to Paul and said, "Sir, what must we do? To, what must I do to be saved? What did he say? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. It's always faith. Jesus Christ Himself talking to Nicodemus, He told Nicodemus how to be saved. As, they, as Moses lifted the swan in the, in the serpent, uh, lifted the uh, snake in the serpent, so that so shall it be that when the Son of Man is lifted up, anyone who looks to the man, Son of Man and believes in Him will be saved. Well, the pattern in the, in the wilderness: Moses lifted the serpent. That was all that Moses did. Those who were beaten by the serpent, what did they do? They just look at the serpent. And they were healed. They didn't do any work. And Jesus Christ took that concept. In fact, what Moses lifted was a was a, uh, a pattern of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will be lifted on the cross. So that anyone who looks at Christ and believes on him will be saved. Salvation is a free gift. And the way to receive it is faith. No other way. We are not saved because we we knew we knew that and say God I'm not going to sin again. That is not the basis of salvation. The basis of salvation is God's way. What's God's way? Believe on His Son Jesus Christ. And so, when I when I put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, when I believe in Christ, what He did on the cross for me, that He paid for my sins on the cross. When I believe on Christ. God the Holy Spirit. This is uh, I'm gonna I'm, something I'm gonna clear up something here. God the Holy Spirit takes me and puts me and puts me into Christ. God the Holy Spirit picks me up and puts me into Christ. Are we following? Are we following? When I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, that's his job. He takes me, I didn't see him do it. That's a spiritual renewal, that's a spiritual work. It's done invisibly. God the Holy Spirit picks me and puts me into Christ. Because I am in Christ, therefore I share in Christ's sanctification by position. By position. Because I am in Christ, I share in Christ's position. That's what you call positional sanctification. Positional sanctification. God didn't sanctify you alone. He didn't sanctify you because you are good. He didn't sanctify you because of anything you have done. He sanctified you because you are in Christ. This place.
that this pain I gave you an illustration before wasn't didn't turn black because it, it was good to turn black. It turned black because of immunity and it's shared in the color of my jacket. That's position. Positional sanctification. And so what's that uh, uh, lizard? What's that lizard that Whenever he goes, it, it, it absorbs the color. Very good. Very good. That's exactly who we are. Here, we are spiritually dead. But here in Christ, we absorb the color of Christ because we have been identified with Him. We are in Him. Therefore, we share in everything Christ has. We share his life, internal life. We share his righteousness. And the, the Bible, in, 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 our, in, the, in where we are studying, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul went further to make it, what I just showed you on the board, we can now go back in the Bible and read it for ourselves. Like I said, I'm not going to run. If, 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 all, if that's all we study today and you understand it, that's enough. That's grace. Because that will help you to understand grace and pull away from legalism. Legalism is anti-grace. It is anti-God's plan. God doesn't design us for legalism whatsoever. Look at 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30. Let's take it little by little. But first Corinthians, first Corinthians, one verse thirty. First Corinthians one verse thirty. I'll give you time to get there. Do you have it? Okay. Let's, let's take the first uh, uh, phrase. But by his doing, we stop there. That's, that's how you don't, you don't want to run. You just, but by his doing, that phrase alone, but by his, put, what does his refer to? To God. If I say that you are here because of me, I, I made it your way to come here, do you have to boast about it? Look at verse 29. Go back and look at verse 29. That no man should boast before God. That is the key. That no man should boast before God. You and I, we do not have any, any base to, to boast. Because it's not by undoing. It is because of his undoing. By his doing, we are in Christ Jesus. That alone has already begun to underscore grace. You see, people teach us and they tell us all sorts of things. They take the Bible from out of context and they don't they tell us everything. The writing here is so clear. And I'm going to, uh, from here now, I'm going to connect you to other verses of the scripture. <clears throat> and as I connect you to other verses of the scripture, it will begin to make sense to you. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus. Now, keep reading. Who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness? And sanctification. I only need two things there. He became for us. Remember that the uh, lizard. He became for us. We absorb. We, we absorb what he, what Christ stands for. Righteousness, perfect righteousness. We absorb his sanctification. God already sanctified him. So we now have Christ's righteousness. We have his righteousness and we have his sanctification. 
That's what we see in First Corinthians 1 thousand, isn't it? And so, when we stand before God, we are not standing on our basis on the basis of our own sanctification, but on the basis of Christ's sanctification. When we stand before God, we are not standing on the basis of our own righteousness, but on the, on the, on the basis of Christ's righteousness. That's the difference. So you're going to heaven, not on the basis of your own righteousness, but on the basis of Christ's righteousness. The question is, can you improve upon Christ's righteousness? Can you make it better? There's no way. That's grace. That is grace. So when you're saying amazing grace, how sweet the sound, you'll be able to understand what he's thinking about. And so, with that in view, it is God's doing, you are in Christ Jesus, it is not based on your own righteousness, it's not based on your own doing, it is not based on how hard you work, it is not based on how many sins you have eliminated from your life. That is not the basis for your going to heaven. You're going to heaven because of the righteousness of Christ. And he says, not by, own your, not by your own doing. If that's not enough, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. See, that's how you compare scripture with scripture and you get a bigger picture of what the Bible is teaching. 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 1, verse 9. Second Timothy 1 verse 9. Second Timothy 1 9. It says, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works. Does it make sense now? So if anybody wants you to go to heaven and wants you to work hard, <laughs> Just tell the person, I can find the Bible. It's not the way, it's, you can find the Bible. That's man made. People have cooked up all sorts of stew and they bring it up in the church and serve day by day. Tradition. The Bible says you are saved by grace. So that when you read, when you, some people often talk about grace, but they don't really apply grace when it comes to interpretation of the Bible. With this, if I'm, a student, if I'm just sitting down and somebody is teaching me here, this is enough, for, is enough for me to begin to see the picture of grace. That's enough for me to say, ah, I begin to see grace now coming to play. Because it's not me doing it. If it is me doing it, then grace has no value. Turn to Titus 3 verse 5. Just flip a page, a few pages, and you go to Titus 3 verse 5. He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, human righteousness, but according to his mercy by the washing of the generation and renew, renewing by the Holy Spirit. God saved us, not on the basis of our good deeds. That tells you that nobody will go to heaven by good deeds. Good deeds are not meant to take you to heaven. It doesn't mean that when we are saved, that good deeds done by the Holy Spirit is God demands us to live a, a life that honors Him. But that's not the basis for going to heaven. It is our basis for blessing in time and blessing in eternity. God will bless you here when you glorify Him through your living, through your spiritual life. And then when, when you come to heaven, He's going to He's gonna decorate you and give you blessing you can't even dream of, dream of for, forever and ever. That's the difference. 
People often, there is what you call birth, birth. You give birth to a child. Birth and growth are not the same. Isn't it? They, you cannot tear somebody's certificate because it's not growing. We have some children that you, when you give birth to them, when you give birth to them, they, can, they don't grow. Because of one deform, deformity or because of one mutation or whatever in the, in the body, the child is not growing. Some, some children, you, like their mother will give them milk every time breastfeeding them. The first year, the second year, the third year, the fourth year, man, grow away, grow away. The fifth year, grow away. The sixth year, grow away. The mother already knows that something is wrong with her, her baby. It's not growing. She's not going to go to her room and say, I need my certificate, the birth certificate. This, this, this baby is not a child. I'm going to tell you because she didn't grow. She's a child. The same thing in the spiritual arena. Spiritual birth is different from growth. Put them apart. We are born into the family of God by faith. Some of us grow. Some of us don't. Some of us grow rapidly. Some of us grow in a small pace. But we are all children of God. How do we become children of God? Look at Galatians 3. Galatians. Chapter 3. Paul tells us how we have come to assume that name, children of God, or sons of God, or even daughters of God. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. For you are all, no exception, all. For you are all sons, he can even put daughters. If you like better that, that kind of English. But when it says sons, it includes every believer, male or female. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. That's not the only way we are sons. Faith in Christ Jesus. No other way. It is because we are sons of God by faith, we have been born into his family. And once a person is born in the family, can it be unborn? Can it be unborn? Can you put the child back? It's born. It's gone. It's over. It's, it's history. Can't go back and be born again. It's gone. It's over. And so, when we, it is the work of God, you go back to 1 Corinthians 1 30, by his doing. By God's doing, you and I are in Christ Jesus. Nothing to boast about. I, it doesn't even have to be, to, be, to be worried or be concerned about because it's not your own doing. Let, let, me, let, me, let me bring it home. When you are on an airplane and the pilot closes the cockpit, do you see the pilot? Do you help the pilot? When the tumblers shake the plane, do you go and say, pilot, let me come help you? You just sit in there put with your belt. Whether you go higher or go lower or go zigzag is not your business. The pilot is flying. And all you are looking is for the pilot to take you home. Wherever you, wherever you are, destination is. But we have a pilot. God is on the, is on the cockpit. He's in the cockpit. He's flying. He's flying our salvation. It has nothing to do with us. By his own doing, we are on the plane, and he's the one. He is the pilot. Is it possible for his jet to crash? Can the jet crash on that was flying it? Can his, can, his jet, can his jet crash? Is it possible for him to crash in the air? Yes. Can God crash? No. no. God is God can crash. And he's the one in the, he's the 
marry the carpet. I, I remember a hymn that we, not, we used to sing back home. Uh, Jesus Christ is the captain of my boat. And he will land me safely. He is the captain of your boat. He will take you safely. Because he will never sink. No storm can, can sink his boat. Because he has power to calm every storm at any time, anywhere. We, we saw what he did in the, in the sea. When, when the storm came and his disciples woke him up and said, Master, are you not concerned that we are perishing? What did he do? Be hush. Everything will come. <laughs> and Jesus Christ continued their journey. And so, him being the pilot, you have no concern. You can't help him. You can't improve the way he's flying it. You just sit it down with your bell and pop up. The instruction is keep your seat bed buckled while seated. That's the instruction. You can some of us, some people can say, no, I don't like it. That's, that's your business, take it off. If there's two bullets, you're gonna jump and hit your head on the overhead pin. Or you only will get bruised. Those with their seat bed buckled, they will be there. So we have choices. We have we have we have choices to make. But you still he's still flying. But you got bruises. The the flight attendant can bring you bandit and, and, and bandit you with, and give you some ice, ice pack to hold your you are to hold your bruise, but you are still flying. That's the difference. He's still flying. He's not gonna throw you off and say, oh who can bruise? Open that uh, cockpit and throw, open the door and throw him off from the air. No, he's flying. Because you are in the plane, not by your own doing, not by your own deed, not by your own work. If you get on plane by your own work, anytime you mess up, you get thrown out. Does that make sense? If you get on the plane by your own doing, anytime you mess up in your own doing, you'll be thrown out. But we've already, we already read two places in the Bible. Not according to your works. Not according to your deed that you are on the plane. And so, faith. God puts us in Christ and we share the righteousness of God. We share the righteousness of Christ. Through faith, we are sanctified in Christ, positional sanctification. And so, we have no basis to boast for our own righteousness except in the righteousness of our Savior Jesus Christ. Turn to Philippians 3, verse 9. Philippians 3, verse 9. Paul makes it clear. And may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law. In other words, derived from good deeds. Derived from obeying the commandments. You see, when you try to do or do all those things, those laws, there are 613 of them in the Bible, when you try to keep them up and try to be good and try to do that, you are developing righteousness. But we call it self-righteousness. Paul says, not on that basis. Look at the next phrase. But that, that refers to the righteousness. That but that which is true faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Right here. That's what we read in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30. He became for us righteousness. And so you and I, if we boast, we boast on the basis of our knowing Christ on the basis of our relationship with Jesus Christ. 
And so we go back again. Positional sanctification. I'm, I'm going to uh, define it, so to say, so that we will put a, a, a picture to it. I'm going to define it and I'm going to use God, the Holy Spirit. Positional sanctification is a, is a state. Or a means. It's a state or a means by which God the Holy Spirit, by which God the Holy Spirit puts the believer into the body of Christ. Positional sanctification is a state or a means by which God the Holy Spirit puts the believer into the body of Christ. That's another way of defining it. Another, another way, another, the second way of defining it, I'm going to use baptized. Positional sanctification is a state or a means by which God the Holy Spirit baptizes the believer into Christ. But when I use the word baptizes, it's more theological than puts. The puts is a layman's term. Uh, when I say baptize, that's where we come with the word baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's how we come up, come up with the word or uh, the phrase baptism of the Holy Spirit. Let me say it again. Positional sanctification is a means or a state by which God the Holy Spirit takes the believer or by which the, I'm sorry, by which God the Holy Spirit baptizes the believer into Christ. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 13. First Corinthians 2 and 13 says, For by one Spirit, Holy Spirit, we were all. Pay attention to that word, all. We were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. That all is important because I'm going to use that all to show you something. We were all baptized into one, bo into one body. And baptism means identification it just means in a mass you take uh, you take something you take uh, let's say that uh, this is a a, a, a bowl I take this pin and immerse it into that bowl that's where you get immersion or something is identification that's how it came about but uh, here the Holy Spirit takes the believer and puts him into Christ. So this is Christ. This is you as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit puts, puts you in. That's what we call positional sanctification. Positional sanctification. And positional sanctification is done by the Holy Spirit. Baptism of the Holy Spirit. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is the work of the Holy Spirit. But I'm going to make a statement here because we have many people have confused this word baptism of the Holy Spirit. You, I don't know about I don't know about you, but I have heard so many people. I have read it in books and so many areas. People tell us that baptism of the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues. People say that. And baptism of the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues. 
is not. It is not. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is not speaking in tongues. And I'm going to show you from the Bible. I said, I'm going to show you from the scripture. That's why the Bible asks us to come and examine. You see, there are a lot of things we do in ignorance. But when you come to see the Bible, you can't fight the Bible. That, that's, that's the only reason, that's my defense. I see I travel, I travel all over the world. I speak to write thousands of pastors. But my defense, you see, some of those people that I, I talk to, some of them are more mature, more grown, and more this thing. But the only thing that they don't squeeze me like they feel not is that I use the word of God as my defense. So when I use the word of when I use the word of God as my defense, it's difficult for you to fight the word of God. So while you are trying to argue with the word of God, I'm already gone. I'm not around. <laughs> That's the difference. Because you, you're contending with the word, not with me. So let me say that, that again. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is not speaking in tongues. I'm going to say that one clear. Once I say that clear, then I'll continue learning, uh, with our study. Go back to 1 Corinthians 2, verse 13. In the same chapter, not even uh, chapters, the same chapter I'm going to let you know that it's not speaking in tongues. Go back to verse 13. 12 to 10. For by one spirit we were all baptized into Christ. 1 Corinthians 12 to 10 says, All. All were baptized. Let me ask you a question. If all we are back, if all means if baptism of the Holy Spirit means this, it means all we speak in tongues, isn't it? Isn't it? Yes. From that English alone, that thing is say, oh, we are baptized. That means all we speak in tongues. If, if baptism of the Holy Spirit means speaking in tongues, isn't it? Okay, let's go back to the same chapter. Turn to verse 29. Paul begins to deal, Paul was handling, Paul used three chapters to deal with the, the issue that was happening, the problem that was going on in Corinth. That's not what we're handling now. Look at verse 29. All are not apostles, are they? Can we answer that question? All are not apostles, are they? No. All are not teachers, are they? No. All are not workers of miracles, are they? No. All do not have gifts of healings, do they? No. All do not speak with tongues, do they? Can we change our no? We can't change our no, it's still no. So if you say that baptism of the Holy Spirit means everybody will speak in tongues, that verse has contradicted it. Say no, no. Oh. Are we seeing it? Just in the same chapter. So baptism of the Holy Spirit means God in Holy Spirit taking the believer and putting him into Christ. That's why it says we are all baptized into one body. We are immersed into one body. Uh, and uh, Paul says it best in Colossians. He says that your life is hidden in Christ. Your life is hidden in Christ. That's why it's, it will be difficult for anybody to tamper with you. Your life is hidden in Christ and Christ is hidden in God. That's maximum security from heaven. For somebody to tamper with you, he has to deal with God first. If he conquers God, he will find Christ and conquer Christ before he gets to you because you are in Christ. 
That's the unique security you and I have. And we shouldn't worry about any danger that anybody may try to throw at us. And so, again, baptism of the Holy Spirit is not speaking in tongues. You cannot speak in tongues unless you are baptized with the, in the Holy, with the Holy Spirit, or unless you are baptized with the Holy Spirit. And baptism of the Holy Spirit by itself is not speaking in tongues. In other words, you can't be, unless you are in Christ, that is the only way you, can, you have the opportunity to speak in tongues. But being in Christ in itself does not mean everybody will speak in tongues. Because Paul has, Paul, that's, that's the Paul's argument. Paul, Paul, concerning everybody speaking in tongues, Paul used the body analogy. Paul said, in, in his body analogy, he said, uh, all, well, if all the body is one in his head, where will the eyes be? That's what Paul was saying. Just think of it, if your whole body is leg, or if your whole body is just the uh, eye, you wouldn't be here. You still be at home. Because you don't have legs to walk. So Paul was saying, division of labor, division of labor, using the human anatomy to describe how God has given in the church. To some he gave the gift of apostle, to some he gave the gift of prophets, to some he gave the gift of healing, to some he gave the gift of uh, uh, speaking in tongues, to some he gave the gift of interpretation. Division of labor. Not only one person, ha not only one person has all those gifts. That's what Paul was trying to show us here. But in churches today, you see people say that every, every person in the church must speak in tongues. I don't know where they get it from. I tell you where they got it from, from Mark 16. And Mark 16 stopped in verse 8 in the original Bible. Verse 9, somebody added it to the translation. It's not part of the Bible. But that's, another, that's a different story. That's not, I don't want to take you out from where we ought to be. Let us concentrate in what we're saying, what, what our teaching is now. What, our, what is our teaching? Sanctification. Sanctification is the work of God, not the work of man. It is the work of God. God does the work. That's why he gets all the glory. God gets all the glory because he does the work. We cannot boast because it's not by our own doing. It is by God's doing. And so, how do we get in? Faith. Is, is faith work? Faith is not work. That's why it's grace. You simply believe. By believing, you have eternal life. That's why the Bible says, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that by believing in his name, you have eternal life. Very simple. The thief on the cross, he didn't do any, any work, did he? The thief on the cross, did he do any work? He was so evil. In fact, he didn't, if I were the person uh, getting, uh, evaluating him for eternal life, he wouldn't, he wouldn't get it. Evil. Society had already abandoned him and said, you, you're no good. He, was, he just had a few minutes to die. And he didn't have time to confess his sin. In fact, he was never asked to confess his sin. We didn't know what, what sin he committed. He may have killed 10 people. We didn't know. It wasn't, it wasn't necessary for him to confess them. Because confessing of that person is not the basis for salvation. It is not the basis for salvation. Jesus Christ was praying for his sins on the cross, wasn't he? How do we get saved? Faith alone, in Christ alone. And that's why when the, when the, when the thief on the cross said to Jesus Christ, when you go to paradise, remember me. You know, for, for, for him to say, when you go to paradise, remember me, that means he had just believed that he is the Lord. Isn't it? He believed. 
that he's the Lord, he's Jesus Christ. He, that means he believes that he's going to paradise. That's faith. That's all Jesus Christ took the faith from, from that statement. And told him, today shall thou be with me in the paradise. He didn't do any work. He wasn't even baptized. Because he was too late for, for, for baptism. So baptism, baptism is not even is not part of salvation. That would be a work. Salvation, we are saved. I can illustrate this to you. In Acts of the Apostle, chapter 10, when, when Peter went to the house of Polonius, in Acts 10, he was preaching the gospel to them. Let's go to Acts 10. Like I said, I'm not going to run. If, I, if I'm running, tell me, Moses, you are running. I'll slow down. Sometimes I forget what I say, I keep running. We're not going to read the whole thing, but Peter went to the house of Colonius. Colonius was a Gentile who was searching for God. God sent him to the house of Colonius. And when Peter began to preach the gospel to him, look at verse 38. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the evil, for God was with him. And he kept on giving, giving the house, Colonius and his household, the gospel. Look at verse 43. Of him, all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes. Do you see the key? They were listening, just like we are listening now. They were all listening to Peter, giving the gospel. And what Peter came to the issue, he made it clear. Everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness. Again, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. Look at verse 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. Ah. They must have believed. Because Peter had given them the clue for salvation. Who believes in Christ. And hearing that portion, they just say, we believe in Christ. In their souls. Once God saw the signal of faith in them, boom, they all received not only forgiveness, but they received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the key I want to make there is that the, what I want to underline there is that they haven't been baptized yet. The, the receiving of the Holy Spirit is a sign that we have been accepted into God's family, isn't it? Isn't it a sign? God cannot give you His very Spirit if you are not His Son. So the people in the house already received the Holy Spirit without being baptized yet. Later on, Peter said, what, what shall prevent us from baptizing them? Ah! He was baptizing those who were already saved. So had the rapture occurred while they were still in the house there, oh, boom, they're going to heaven. Just as the thief for the cross went to heaven. And so, baptism of the Holy Spirit is the work of God, not the work of man. Sanctification is the work of God. Sanctification is the work of God, not the work of man. We have the righteousness of Christ. We have the righteousness of Christ. We have his, we share his sanctification. 
That's what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1.30. Or we are baptized into Christ. That's what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13. And I have made it clear that baptism of the Holy Spirit is not speaking in tongues. If we, if, if we were speaking in tongues, if it means speaking in tongues, that means everybody will speak in tongues. But Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 29 through 30 that speaking in tongues wasn't meant for everybody. Now, having said that, having said that, uh, uh, I think uh, we've made this clear enough. Now we go to our verse. We go to our verse in the our our uh, section in First Corinthians one, where we all began this in introduction of sanctification. First Corinthians chapter one. We have already seen that the Corinthians were very poor spiritually. They were the worst church in Paul's day. They failed in every aspect of spiritual life. Sin abound in that church in various categories. And Paul says in verse 2, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2, to the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus. Saints. We see in that, uh, uh, in 1 Corinthians, Paul used that word sanctified. Sanctified. In, in, in your English, in the Greek, in the Greek, it is in passive. It is also in perfect in Greek. That word alone, that's how it is in the Greek. In the original word. When Paul when Paul spoke it, this is how he how he spoke it. Because when a, when a Greek person says something, he will identify the tense in which he's communicating. So that he, his hearer will understand what he's communicating. In English, we don't, we, don't, we don't do that. And so, when Paul said, you have been sanctified, passive. That passive force means something. It means you are not the one doing it. That is the meaning of passive force. If I say to Tony, Tony, come here, passive, Tony will just stay where he is. Even if I'm the commander in chief, I said, Tony, please come, come here. Even if I use the commandment, I said, Tony, come here. And I said it in passing. Tony will just sit put. He will not make a move. Soldiers around here will come to, and pick him up on that chair and bring him up to me. That's passing. If I use the word inactive, Tony will get up and walk on himself to me. But passive means Tony, stay where you are, somebody will bring, bring you to me. So when Paul said you are sanctified and he puts, he puts it in passive, it means somebody did it for us. Jesus, God did it for us. God sanctified us. We didn't sanctify ourselves. That is the key. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30, by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus. Who became for you sanctification? Are we getting it? Is it, is it? is it getting clear? Again, that word in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2, sanctified, is also in perfect tense. It's also in perfect tense. And perfect tense means something that takes place at a moment with a result that continues forever. That's perfect tense in the Greek. You can't change it otherwise. In other words, at one point of time, you are sanctified in Christ with a result that continues forever. You can't change it. Nobody can change it. That's what the Bible says. 
Anybody who can change it will, will have to go back in the original language and change it there. But if you can change it in the original language, it stands. And that's where we get we get we get our uh, we, that's where our teaching comes from, from the original. When you understand what the original says, you don't care about what people make 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 out of it. The original says that it's, it's not your own doing. So if, if the original says not your own doing, and someone tells you, my sister, you have to work hard, you have to sanctify yourself, you have to do seven things. There are seven points to do to sanctify yourself. You say no. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says it's not by my, by my own doing. It's by God's doing. I can't sanctify myself. God has already sanctified me in Christ Jesus. That's grace. That is the meaning of grace. And so, sanctification, as we see it here, Paul says, to the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified. Again, we look at the church at Corinth. We have incest, we have drunkards, we have uh, those who still participate in prostitution, we have all kinds of, we have a marriage pro, marital problem, we have uh, lawsuits, we have everything in that church. That's why it was one of the worst churches. And yet Paul said to them, you have been sanctified. When I say that sanctification has nothing to do with sin, can you not see what I mean? If it had to do with sin, Paul would have said, Oh no! I made a mistake when I said, you, said, said that you people were saved before. I'm, I'm confused. I don't think your people were saved at all. You need to be saved. Knowing that they were saved not because of who they were, not because of what they did, we already see it in the first, second Timothy 1 verse 9. He saved us not on the basis of our deeds. Titus 3 verse 5, not on the basis of our own good making. So, the Corinthians were not no exceptional, isn't it? They, if they continue in this lifestyle, Many of them is been, many of them will die. They still not to death. But they still go to heaven. They will, they, when they go to heaven, they will lose the reward. They will lose the reward God has for them here, and in heaven they will have nothing. That is the issue of First Corinthians 3. Turn to First Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 1, Paul says, and, and I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to babes in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you are not able, for you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? And are you not walking like mere men? Then look at verse 11. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. You see, what Paul was telling them is that foundation has been laid. And that foundation is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the foundation on which the Corinthian church was laid. Jesus Christ is that foundation. There's only one foundation. And Paul went on to say, in verse 12, Now if any man builds upon the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw. On the foundation there are two groups of believers in the Corinth. Not all Corinthians, we are really immoral believers. 
there were some few of them that were not in what Paul was telling, but very, very, very few. Like the household that reported their behavior, the household of cloak in Basilean. I, I believe they, they didn't like what they were saying in the church. There were still people. So there were two groups of builders. After salvation, the issue is building. Building. That is the issue. In salvation. After salvation, the issue is building. Remember we said before, when you and I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we said that sanctification is divided into three. Positional, experiential, ultimate. Experiential is building your daily spiritual life. How you live your life unto God, that is building. And what you build talks about the material. You see, the type of material you use in building will display your work, isn't it? If, 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 I, if, if, if we would go out here and build a house, and some of us don't care, we just, we just take any material we, like, we want here and build, and some of us will go to the market and find the quality material. When we build, it will show. When you, when you finish our structure, it will show. That's what Paul was telling them here in, at Corinth. He said that salvation is done not by works, but the rewards is by works, spiritual works. That's the difference. And so he said, we are building, two groups of believers are building. The canal, the canal believer, the canal, the canal believers, they build with wood, hay, straw. This represents the type of behavior and spiritual life that believers lead. Careless life. Another group of believers, I will call spiritual. Of good believers, they build it with silver, gold, precious stone. That too depicts their spiritual life. They are learning the word of God, applying it to their lives day by day. That is silver, gold, and precious stone. That's what God looks and says. Wonderful, good job, good work. You are using what I have given you in grace and you are glorifying me in this life. Paul, Paul continues in verse 13. Look at verse 13. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 13. If any man's work which he has built upon it remains, he shall receive a reward. So you see, the issue there is a reward. After salvation, the issue is reward. Not a not salvation, not eternal life. Eternal life, you didn't get it by work. If you didn't get eternal life by work, you, wouldn't, you can't keep it by work. Does it make sense? If you, are, if you are saved by works, you must keep it by works, isn't it? But none of us is saved by works. Look at verse 15. If any man's work is burned up, he shall suffer loss. He shall suffer loss. Loss of what? Reward. That's the issue. But he himself shall be saved. Yet as one saved through fire. Is it what the Bible says? Why must he be saved? Because his salvation has nothing to do with his work. But the quality of his life as a believer on earth has no value. Therefore, he will suffer loss. Loss of the eternal reward God has for those who has honored him on this in this life. That is the issue after our salvation. It's a matter of honoring and glorifying God. 
Again, we go back to uh, First Corinthians. Still where you are in, in First Corinthians chapter three by sixteen. Remember that Paul was addressing to them. Paul was handling the problems that was going on at Corinth. And in doing so, look at what he said in verse 16. Do you not know that you are a temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? Look at that verse. Look at it from another angle. You know what Paul was trying to tell them? Let me use a, a language you would understand better. My friends, at Corinth, let me tell you, if you don't know what you're doing, you are a temple of God. Not that you will be, you are already a temple. And God lives in you. While you may not know that, while you may be going and doing all those things and uh, living that kind of a spiritual life, I just want you to know, you are a temple doing that. That's exactly what Paul was telling them. He wasn't telling them, well, you're going to be a temple one day. No, 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 no. They, are, they were already temples of God. And, what, and Paul made it clear to them. Don't you know? In other words, are you, are, you, are, you, are, you, are you ignorant of the fact that you are a temple already? If you're a temple, why are you doing those things? Why are you, li why are you living that way? That's exactly what Paul was trying to tell them. Paul was trying to bring their attention. And uh, 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 look at the uh, chapter 6, verse 20. Um, look at verse, verse 19 and 20. Or do you not know? Or do you not know? Or are you ignorant that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God, and that you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. Paul he again was calling the attention to the fact that they were already temples of God. This member of that church was a temple of God. And each member has been purchased. By who? By who? By God. That's grace. Isn't it? I know that what you have, what I'm teaching you. I know to I, 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 will, I, will, I will assume to many of you that's new. I know that's not, to me it's not new. I, it's not, I don't, that, the experience is not new. That's the experience I have all over the world. So don't feel uh, don't feel uh, intimidated or oh I'm just learning this thing for for the first time like this. Yeah, it's the grace of God. God it was God's plan that you be here. There are people out of town that are not here. But God brought you here for a reason. If you, if you just three, four, five, ten, ten people, why not here, the number that understood. Just one thing. Our tickets will be paid in full. And so, sanctification is the work of God. And what does it mean? Why, why am I teaching you this? Is to help you to connect to grace. So that when you read verses in the scripture, you will have appreciation of the grace of God. See, the deeper appreciation you have, the more gratitude you have for God. You don't, uh, you don't give, uh, you don't have uh, appreciation unless you have, uh, you have, unless you understand uh, uh, what God has done for you. God has done everything for us, and therefore you and I can uh, uh, approach Him 
with gratitude. Back to First Corinthians chapter one, verse two. To the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, since here Paul called every believer a saint. Every believer is a saint. There is no such thing as special sainthood. No such thing in the Bible. That's foreign. Every believer is a saint. First Corinthians chapter 1 verse 2. Paul called them, anyone here that has been sanctified, Paul called that person a saint. And a saint, a saint is not on the basis of one's merit. You see the difference? Sainthood is not on the basis of one's merit, but on the basis of Christ's merit. Because we share in Christ's sanctification, therefore we are called saints. Every believer is a saint. It's because of a human error in interpretation of the Bible and a lot of traditions that we have St. Luke, St. Matthew, St. Mark, St. John, St. This, St. This, and St. That. No, we don't have. Every believer is a saint. Because it's, it's not based on our merit. It's not based on our own doing. Remember what Paul said, by his own doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became for you sanctification. And because Christ became for us sanctification, we are all saints. Look at verse 3. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 4. I thank my God always concerning you. Ah, oh, Paul. Don't you know the Corinthians? Don't you have your, your record in front of you? And yet he says, I thank my God every time concerning you. What was he talking God about? That they, they were drunkards in the church? Was he talking God that they were uh, immor immorality in, uh, Church of Corinth, was it what he was thanking God for? No. Paul, Paul viewed, look at verse 4 again. Paul viewed grace. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace. Paul understood we are not for the grace of God, the Corinthian church will not go to heaven. But he said, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus. It's always in, 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 in. That's why we stress on the issue of positional sanctification. You are what you are in God because of what, who and what you are in Christ. Without you being in Christ, you have nothing. That's why Paul, he learned this concept of positional sanctification on his way to Damascus when he was going to torture to, to abuse and they have skilled Christians he was on his way going and our Lord Jesus Christ met him on the way and when he shone the light on him he said Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting the church? is that what he said? Why are you persecuting Christians? Is that what the Lord said? He said, why are you persecuting me? Paul said, oh, persecuting you? Persecuting Christians, how, how, how are they related to you? Paul learned the truth that a persecution of, of, a, of a believer is a persecution of Christ. When you abuse a believer, you are abusing Christ. Because a believer is a Christ. Paul learned that lesson in, in, on his way to Damascus. And so, anybody, anybody that is trying to read a call or do anything with a believer, the person should just know that he's dealing with Christ. Because that's where a believer is.
And because of our position in Christ, which we have the grace of God. That's why Paul said to them, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus. That in everything you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge. Verse 6. And even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you. Verse 7. So that you are not lacking in any gift. I waited eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. I waited eagerly for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who were waiting? Who? Who were waiting eagerly? Is it the Corinthians? By human standard, are they qualified to be waiting? No, not even close. But Paul told them you were waiting in Cali for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. You go back to grace. That's why they were waiting. We are not for the grace of God, none of us will go to heaven. It's that simple. Even the best of our, if, even the best of us, none of us will go to heaven. We are not for the grace of God because we fail. We all fail from time to time. You may not have, failures are in different packages. You may have the smallest package, but it's still failure. You can't, you can't tell me, well, my package is small, and therefore kill that person with big package. Well, it's still failure. If God will, will not accept us because of failure, that means all failures will not make it to heaven. And that's why we, it, it, we come to understand that we make it to heaven on the basis of who and what Christ is because of our position in him. Not by works, lest any man should boast. Now when you read Ephesians 2 verse 8 and 9, Ephesians 2 8 and 9, it will make meaning to you. Ephesians Chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. Paul says, For by grace are you saved through faith. That salvation. In, that is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. If salvation is based on, a, on your own uh, effort, based on your own merit, you have every right to boast. But you, uh, Satan was dethroned from heaven because of boasting, pride. And God doesn't want to duplicate that pride again. That's why he removed everything that will lead us to pride. In our soul, there is no soil. There is no soil to plant the seed of pride in us. We just not. It is the soil of righteousness of Christ. You don't, you don't, that, is, that is not your own property. You don't plant on a soil that doesn't belong to you. You don't taste pass. That's plus, that's plus property. It's righteousness. And so the seed of your pride has no basis to go. That's why Paul says in Philippians 39, not on the basis of my own righteousness, but on the basis of the righteousness of Christ. So there is no room for boasting. And so when you and I go home, we will make it will, it, will, it, will, it will be so clear to us first that our sanctification is the work of God. 
You cannot improve upon that. God's work is always perfect because God is perfect. His work is perfect. When God is done, He's done. His work will stand because it was done in perfection. Not on the basis of our own work. Otherwise, God will have problem dealing with us. God is the one doing the work. God begins, God will end. He begins by means of grace, He will end in grace. So that when you and I appear in heaven, we will have no room to boast except in the perfect example of our, who is our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, in, in, in concluding uh, this, uh, uh, in just a, a review of what we examined, and then we will call it a, a day. Again, remember sanctification is divided into three. Positional sanctification, expiration sanctification, ultimate sanctification. Expiration sanctification is our building, like the Apostle Paul talked in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11 through 15. It has to do with your spiritual living. Day by day, God is watching you. Day by day, as you learn the word of God and apply the life of Christ, you duplicate the life of Christ. You are glorifying God. As you are glorifying God, God is blessing you here on earth. He's giving you more blessing because you have capacity to handle His blessing and appreciate Him. When you go to heaven, He is going to give you even more. He said, I have not seen nor ear heard what God has in store for those who love Him. And so, that's spiritual sanctification. Ultimate sanctification is God removing the believer from this life and taking him home to be with him forever and ever and ever and ever. That's then we, 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 we took up the position, positional sanctification. We saw that Jesus Christ was sanctified. Not because he sinned. That let us know that sanctification has nothing to do with sin. God the Father sanctified Jesus Christ. John 10 36. When we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we, God the Holy Spirit takes us and puts us into the body of Christ. Because we are in the body of Christ, we share His sanctification. And so, when a person says you are sanctified, you say to the person, yes, I'm sanctified, but I'm sanctified in Christ. My sanctification has nothing to do with me. The Bible is saying, how do you know? I know because the Bible tells me. You say, where does the Bible say? First Corinthians 1 verse 30. By his own doing, you are in Christ Jesus. Who became for you? Sanctification. And so that, that's, that makes it so clear to you. And you share the righteousness of God. The righteousness of Christ. For you to be with God, you must be as good as God is. Therefore, you have his own righteousness with you. That qualifies you to be with him. So when you stand before God, like Paul says, you're not standing on your own righteousness. You're standing on the righteousness of Christ. That's the difference. And so that was done by the Holy Spirit. So we, we mentioned that baptism of the Holy Spirit is that means by with every believer. That's why it says all oh, is entered into the body of Christ. It is not speaking in tongues. Because not all was meant to speak in tongues. We saw that in verse 29 and 30. First Corinthians 12, verse 29 and 30. That's when we read that. And so we continue. In, in First Corinthians 1, verse 2, we saw sanctified. The word sanctified here is in a perfect tense in Greek. It's also in passive. Passive means we're not the one involved. Perfect tense means God has finished it. In fact, we, you say, well, you say, how, how do we know? It, 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 it's not something that will be done. It's not being done every day. God will renew it. Next year, you see how you stand and see whether you will renew it. No. Perfect tense means it's finished. It's over. It will not be redone again. Why? The one who did it is perfect. 
His work is perfect. His work is finished. When it comes to your position of sanctification. Turn to, let's again review uh, Hebrews 10. We read it yesterday. Let's read it again. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews 10. Verse 10. By this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. To you, what does once for all mean? When somebody says something once and for all, what does it mean? It's finished. It's, finished. it's completed. If, 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 if maybe, the, I, I like the way the Holy Spirit does it. Sometimes he does it in so many ways so that if you don't hear this, if you don't hear it, if you don't get like language this way, let me see if you get it this way. Look at verse 14. For by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who have been sanctified. That's another way. Perfected. If God has made you perfect, who can change what God has done? Nobody. That is the grace of God. That is the work of God. Our life is building. What you build is what you'll be rewarded for. Your building has nothing to do with your salvation. Your salvation has been completed. God cannot change it because God cannot undo His work. And that prepares us. And tomorrow we will take some of your questions. And uh, I will take a little bit of time to dwell on experiential sanctification. How come believers are not enjoying spiritual life? How come many believers are not enjoying what God wants them to enjoy? How come we are not having the blessing that God intends for us? I will speak on that tomorrow and then I will give you time for questioning. I'll probably use the first hour and speak on that and then I'll use the next hour for questioning. With your head bowed and your eyes closed. We bring our study to a close and we want to invite anyone here who may be here without Christ and without hope. We want you to know that Jesus Christ had you personally on his mind when he was hanging on the cross. Every sin was judged on the cross. There is not a sin that was not judged. Past, present and future. They were all judged 2,000 years ago. The door of salvation is wide open for anyone to walk in through that door by putting your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He is the door. We cannot go to heaven by being good. We cannot go to heaven by our own righteousness. We cannot go to heaven by uh, helping other people or doing anything of anything that will uh, that will reflect goodness. We go to heaven on the merit of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, "For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him will never perish, but will have eternal life." Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. That's what the Bible says. Heavenly Father, once again, we are grateful to you for bringing our uh, Bible exposition to, uh, to a close this afternoon. It is our prayer, O oh God, that you will take your word, which you have communicated, and make it a source of blessing and challenge to those who are here. It is our prayer, O oh God, that as, the, as we go to our various homes, that your Holy Spirit will continue to bring this into our memory. 
and cause us to meditate on, on your truth, that your truth will become part of us, that we will take what we've learned, digest it, make it part of our lives, and pass the truth to others, that other people will come to understand the same thing you have opened our eyes to, that our salvation, our sanctification, has nothing to do with us, but it has everything to do with you. And Father, we, call, we pray that you will cause us to have a deeper appreciation of your truth. For you have said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And Father, we pray that you will help us in the remaining day, that you will, as we gather here again tomorrow, we pray that your Holy Spirit will open our eyes even deeper, that at the end of the program, we can say, indeed, God has been with us. Indeed, he has opened our eyes to the truth. Indeed, we have been blessed. We lift our prayer in the name of the one who loved us, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, our wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray. Amen.